Let's pay homage to the Buddha, the fully enlightened one. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Namo tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa. I will pay respect to the Buddha. Buddha Bodhaya Titi Danto Yo Dhammatayasa. Dhammataya tanto dhammante no vatrana yasa Nibuto nibbana taya tan lokatrana nami Lokatrano lokatumba i kusaya tasu pshito mudo Yo nago buddha naga miro ya di ya se de ya to touch him ya swap ya di Udo de sali in kuro rain to ten ti miendo muvi pye yue Oda ya sa chutai ta du bo bo lu do ko tu ten len ti ja ba zi jen chu nga la ga Danto kuroga bin yen chiro muvi pshe yue Dhammataya sa chutai ta tu bubu luru kutu me yuen yen chi cha si chen ga le ga Danto kurain ga bin kili ta upu kati inye indo muvi pshe yue Dhammataya sa chutai ta tu bubu luru Kutu me yuen kile ta pu nyin ja ba se chen ga la ga Te no va tante ya na wang gara chan go Kutan to cha puro da ya pi pi yi da le yin Dere na ya sa kuro ta tu cha tai tu ro ne pu ta wang ma ve kan do Kuta chau chau yau cha ba zi jin chau nga la ga Nebu to ki le ta pre ne ba we sa yau te Kura na e nye no mu vi pshe yue Ne ba na ta ya sa kura ta tu we ne lu ro pu ka te nye ja ba zi jin chau nga la ga Dhamman nizin li na dhamma sako Dede di guru na shi ta mi ta pshi Ho cha ro mu khe ba be yi Loka dre na loka tung ba yi ko sa ya da su pshi to mu do Ta na ga mu da na ga mi ro ya di ya se de ya to Nami namami ko nao na lao to sang piang piang Mango shao yui gato miyan no la sang mo yui Shikho nyo pa yi miya swa piang miya swa piang Today, I'm going to give a new talk. The name of the talk is Liberation. Do you want to liberate? When we look back 
into our country's recent history, we find that 60, 63 years ago today, our nation gained its independence. How many years ago? 63 years ago. What is Independence Day of Singapore? Do you remember? Singapore was liberated from Malaysia on August 1965, right? The Nation Day of Singapore is celebrated every year on August. In commemoration of Singapore's independence from Malaysia in 1965. In other words, we were liberated. Now, what were we liberated from? And what type of independence was it that we gained? Can you answer me? What type of independence was it that we gained? I'm sure that it was not the type of liberation which we are trying to seek in the Dharma sense. True? I'm sure it is not the type of liberation which we are trying to seek in the Dharma sense. If I were to ask if you have been really liberated, what would you answer? What would you answer? All right, then, as a nation, we have gained independence. But, think carefully, please, as human beings, have we gained independence? As human beings, have we gained independence? Have we been liberated? Many questions. We can say that we are stay bound captive in the round of rebirths. We are stay bound captive in the round of rebirths and the sufferings of samsara. Anything that, that is held in captivity, what is? Anything that is held in captivity, in fetters, in chains, bound or imprisoned, is contrary to independence, liberation, freedom or emancipation. Now I want to share the teachings of the Buddha. On one occasion, a great number of people had been put in bondage by King Basenadi of Kosala. Some with robes, some with clocks, and some with chains. Who put people into bondage? Basenadi of Kosala, King Basenadi of Kosala put people in bondage, some with robes, some with clocks, and some with chains. Then in the morning, a number of bhikkhus who were going for arms happened to pass by the prison camp. Prison camp? that they were shocked to see prisoners bound, fettered, shackled, and restrained in assorted ways and postures. 
The bakers thought to themselves, How weary and miserable they must be! What a confined existence these people are going through! Do you think so? With such thoughts going through their minds, they arrived in the presence of the Buddha, where they respectfully informed him, saying, Buddha, we have witnessed, we have found various forms of confinement imposed on prisoners. Such kinds of imprisonment seem extremely difficult to escape from. Do you think so? Such kinds of imprisonment seem extremely difficult to escape from. So said the bhikkhus to the Buddha. This is their opinion. They think this is the confinement extremely difficult to escape from. The Buddha, to this the Buddha said, by bhikkhus, the noble and the wise do not consider it so difficult to be free of the kinds of imprisonment that you have seen. So there, at that time, the Buddha recited the following verses. The wise say, that bond is not very strong, which is made of iron, wood or rope. But infatuation with jewelry and earrings, anxious concern of wives and children, the wise say, this is a bond that is strong, degrading, supple, do you understand supple? Flexible, pliant. The wise say, this is a bond that is strong, degrading, subtle, and hard to escape. Anxious. Hard to escape. So what the Buddha said, the bond is, that bond is not very strong, which is made of iron, wood or rope. The wise didn't say that such type of confinement is difficult to escape. What the wise say, this is a bond that is strong, degrading, flexible, pliant, but hard to escape. Which one? Anxious concern of wives and children. I will explain in more simple English. Because the noble and the wise don't consider it so difficult to be free of the kinds of imprisonment that you have seen. They all see people had been put in bondage some with ropes, some with clocks, and some with chains. There exists a particular type of confinement which is indeed extremely difficult to be free of. Do you know what confinement it is? Extremely difficult to free of. What the Buddha was referring to was the closed relationship wherein a man and woman shackle themselves to each other. 
It is called marriage or matrimony. Another term which I find very descriptive and appropriate is wedlock. Do you understand? Wedlock. Do you see what I mean? You get wet and you get locked. Is it true? You get wet and you get locked. Both at the same time. That means that you have been shackled and you have lost your freedom. One usual outcome from this wedlock is offspring. In other words, children. With this, you add another shackle to your imprisonment. You then start making efforts to accumulate inanimate sensual objects such as gold, silver, jewelry, houses, cars, and etc., which are further ties that you become bound by. Those animate sensual objects binding you, of which it is extremely difficult to be free, are of, of course, your children, your young children, your husband or wife, and so on. Now, if I were to ask you, who are listening in this audience, if you could renounce your young children and go and practice the Dharma for your entire life at the Pau Meditation Center, what would you say? What would you say? What is your answer? Renounce your young children or your old children and go and practice the Dharma entire life in the Pa'ak Center. What would you say? Can you go? No bande be can't. This is your answer, I think. All right, then. That is the imprisonment, which is extremely difficult to be free of. So set the noble and the wise ones. In which case, haven't you locked yourself up in this prison? Do you get what I mean? In which case, haven't you locked yourself up in this prison? Yes, you surely have. Now it is difficult to let let go of those animate and inanimate material things that you had been shackled to. I want to ask our Nyama people, do you get the meaning shackle? Hmm? Can you explain? Shackle. Shagal is binding, so like a feta. Feta, do you know? If we bind one another, or if he some, if he holds, if he binds somebody with ropes, so it is shagal. Okay. I will repeat it. Now it is difficult to let go of those animate and inanimate material things that you have been shackled to. It is a rare person in this world who with the aim of liberating himself from the sufferings of samsara has endeavored and succeeded in renouncing and freeing himself of those things. These shagas are indeed very subtle, 
very subtle, very soft, but extremely firm. Those who are in prison, those who are tied with ropes or with wood or any iron, there is a day they can be free from it. They can be free of it. But all of you, with the very subtle, very soft shackles, such as sons, daughters, wife, husband. So these are very difficult to be free of. Actually, the causes of these shackles should be considered should be considered the true shackles. The real times are not those animate beings that happen to be your son, your daughter, your wife, or your husband. Do you get the meaning? The true times are not those animate beings that happened to be your son, your son, your daughter, your wife, your husband are not really true times. Likewise, those inanimate things are not themselves the shackles that are binding you. In truth, there is another factor which brings about the binding element. Can you tell me what it is? There is another factor which brings about the binding element, which are binding you. Is there anybody who can tell me the, what is it? It is craving. It is craving. In actual fact, the animate and the animate and inanimate objects are just as they always have been and always will be. But can all these sensual animate and inanimate objects have any binding power? when displayed in front of the noble arahant? If we display, if we show these attractive, desirable, animate and inanimate objects in front of the noble arahant, can it be a shagal for them? No, it is not. They definitely cannot. What is the reason? They have no craving at all. They have removed craving. That's why it is quite clear that these objects are just there and they themselves do not directly affect anyone or anything. These themselves do not affect anyone or anything. If you have no craving, what is that object? It is not the object of clinging for you. It cannot attract you. Just because of craving, it can attract you. It becomes a shackle. It becomes a tides, it becomes a bone. It is merely the reality of craving that has put you into this prison of existence. Therefore, unless you manage to release yourself from this shackle of craving, you can in no way be a truly liberated. Person. In other, 
in our world today, the longing to be free from oppression is in itself a form of imprisonment. Do you get what I mean? In our world today, the longing to be free from oppression is in itself a form of imprisonment. I will explain more. When a foreign power occupies and rules a country, it is a longing to be free of the foreign occupant that, oppress, that oppresses us. When a foreign country occupies and rules a certain country, people there, they want to be free of the foreign occupant. In fact, we are just putting ourselves back into the prison cell of craving. Do you understand what I mean? Because you want to free off their oppression. You are longing for. You want to be free of their occupant. So it means that you put your, yourself back into the prison cell of craving. You want to be free. Is it the desire? It is craving. You want to be free of their occupant. So you put yourself into another prison called craving. That's why in our world today, the longing to be free of oppression is in itself a form of imprisonment. That's why in the introduction at the beginning of this talk, I mentioned that the conventional view of liberation and the Dharma view of the same word are quite different. What people say, the liberation in conventional view and the liberation in the Dharma view, they are quite different. The conventional understanding of liberation is the superficial type and not the genuine freedom. Are you, liber are you liberated? Yes, conventionally you are liberated. But ultimately you are not. All of us are under much stress and strain today. Why do we feel stress and strain? Because we are not liberated. You have freedom. You have freedom to express. You have freedom to speak. We have freedom to write. But if you do according to your desire, are you liberated? No. That's why we can get freedom. What people say nowadays, we can free of the occupant from others' country power. But if we haven't removed Craving, we are not yet the one who is really liberated from. In truth, we are no more than the slaves of craving. There must be only a few beings in the world who are aware that it is craving or attachment that is constantly 
demanding one thing after another of us. Are you aware of it? Whenever the desire for something appears, do people say, craving wants this object, or do they say, I want this object? How do you say? Craving wants this object, or you want this object? What is your answer? You say craving wants this object? No, never. <laughs> you say I want this object. Now, conventionally, this is true. Nothing wrong with the usage. But ultimately, if you have this understanding, this is not what I want. This is what the craving wants. Only at that time you have right understanding even though you haven't removed the cravings at all. It is always I want it. This is what we understand. Why do we say that? It is because of self-identity. Do you know self-identity? Can you say me in Pali? Sakaya Deity. It is self-identity view. Because of this, because of this wrong view, we think we want it. We, wrong view of the five aggregates as I leads one to believe that craving is also I. There are five aggregates, five khanda. The materiality aggregate, feeling aggregate, perception aggregate, Volitional formation aggregates and consciousness aggregates. Buddha said, those who haven't removed self-identity, they think what the materiality aggregates needs as they are needs. Okay, I will ask you a question. Have you finished your dinner? Finished? Mm. Who need food? What is your answer? Not you, you, you need. Truly? Yeah. Very good. <laughs> okay. So if you have no Dharma knowledge, you will surely give an answer me. You want it. You need the food. Because of the knowledge, because of learning knowledge, hearing knowledge, you give an answer. This is the need of the body. This is right understanding. Those who have removed self-identity, they understand completely. This is not their need. This is the need of the body. Not because of their learning knowledge, just because of their direct knowledge that they can see. This is the need of the materiality aggregate, not of them. In the same way, now, do you feel happy or do you feel sad? What is your answer? What you want? You may, you will be 
happy listening the dharma now who feel it who feels it you feel no feeling aggregate feels only when a person die the mentality stopped completely only remain physical body there is no mentality in the dead body no existing not existing there that's why there is no feeling aggregates walking at that time suppose when i die at that time my body remain but that body cannot feel at all if you say you feel it that body must feel it can feel it at that time but cannot at all what is the reason because mentality one of the mentality mental aggregate which is feeling aggregates is not working at that time that's why the dead body cannot feel anything that's why it is not that you feel it is not that we feel it is the feeling aggregates that feel it this is the right understanding that's why if you are serving something for your feeling if you think because i want i want to feel it means that you are serving the needs of your feeling aggregates only not for you you become a slave at that time that's why wrong view of the five aggregates as i leads one to believe that craving is also i hatred is also seen as i or my hatred everything that is associated with the five aggregates is wrongly considered to be i that's why when craving begins its manipulation all those who have not yet dissociated themselves from the concept of i exist merely as slaves of craving if you haven't removed the self identity view when you are unmindful at the time you will think this is my need this is my desire this is what i want this is what i feel merely just slaves of craving there is hardly anyone who knows that he or she is a slave of craving instead they think they want they desire are we not just fulfilling the demands of craving which demands of craving with the mistaken view that they are the demands of i what is your understanding are you not fulfilling the demands of craving with the mistaken view that they are the demands of you in korea whenever i ask questions also they can't give an answer now in singapore also when i ask question they don't give an answer <laughs> don't you get the meaning i think you get it now at this point i should give you a worldly example every single one of you have some persons above you 
giving orders to do this or to do that. However, for various reasons, you are following this individual's commands, aren't you? Have you nobody above you who is giving orders to you, this and to do that? In Singapore? No? For various reasons, you are following their commands. For money, for living, for position, you listen their commands. If possible, would you like to be free of this kind of situation? Actually, you are meeting such a person for part of the day only, not all the time. However, there is another reality that is forever commanding you, troubling you and binding you. Do you know what it is? I will repeat it. There is another thing that is forever commanding you, troubling you and binding you. It is craving. It is endlessly ordering you to do this thing, pushing you to get that thing and so on. Is it reality not much more terrifying than the reality of those above you in status issuing comments? I think I better not to give the mud talk depending on paper, I think. Hmm? I'm difficult, I think. Hmm? It is endlessly ordering you to do this thing, pushing you to get that thing and so on. Is it really? It is much more terrifying than the reality of those above you who are commanding you. Of course, it is much more frightening. You see with your boss, you listen their instructions, you follow them, not 24 hours, only part of the day, not all the time, but craving it is with you. Since you were born, it is with you. Old and young alike. Since we were born, it commands us. It is ordering us all the time. It is giving instructions us all the time. To do this, to do that. To get it, to get it. Why are you being busy now? No, 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 no. Before coming here. <laughs> Huh? Why are you being busy? Because of this, because of this craving. Furthermore, there are times when hatred or anger troubles you and dejects you. At the time also, you suffer. Also, delusion overwhelms you and fools your mind into thinking that what is right is wrong and vice versa. The reality is that there are jealousy, conceit and stinginess to overwhelm and torment you much, much more than any other person ever could do.
Do you get the meaning? Jealousy, conceit, and stinginess overwhelm and torment us much, much more than your boss. Clear? Mm. The very first stage of being liberated from these afflictions is the time when the self-identity of I, my, me and my are eradicated. The noble person who has attained Sotapanna has done so by ridding himself of self-illusion, skepticism, skepticism and attachment to mere right and ritual. For the stream entry, from the stream enterer, with the attainment of first path and fruition knowledge, his path knowledge removed three things. One is self-illusion, another is doubt, another attachment to mere right and ritual. He or she has realized that truly there is no I. Compared to the ordinary person's mindset, his mindset is many, many times more liberated. If the ordinary reacts according to the arising of his or her anger, why the stream enterer decides that anger is not going to get the better of him and acts accordingly, then isn't the freedom of the stream enterer far greater than that of the Putujana? Because of self identity, all the ordinary people in the world, when they do something, thinking that this is my want, this is my needs. In the same way, when they feel angry, they think, this is my anger, this is my hatred. Whenever they are feeling jealousy, at that time also they think, this is my jealousy, this is my stinginess. In the same way, when they are feeling proud of themselves, at that time also they think this is my pride. Because they haven't removed self-identity, Sakkaya Deity, wrong view. Because of this reason, whatever, whatever mindset occurred in their mind, they wrongly hold them as theirs. But for stream enterer who has removed set identity view completely without remainder, when he or she also feel angry too, because they haven't removed anger. That's why they may feel angry. However, even as they have removed their self-identity wrong view, when they feel angry, they understand the anger torture them. They don't hold as the Putujana, ordinary people hold. I am angry, not in this way. They understand that anger tortures me. How different these two mindsets be? The one who holds anger and defiant mindsets, his or her, his or hers, the one who understands anger and all the defiant as Defilement only. 
That's why the mindset of ordinary persons and the mindset of stream enterer will be different. In an appearance, you may not see the difference. Why? Ordinary persons, as they haven't removed, as they, as they have anger, they feel angry too. For the stream enterer, as he haven't removed, hasn't removed anger, he feel angry too. But the understanding is different. That's why they are different. Another thing, if one does not have unshakable faith in the eight Dharma, the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha, the three trainings, the training of morality, the training of concentration, and the training of insight, past lives, future lives, and karma and its results. How many? I have told all of you. Eight dharmas. If one does not have unshakable faith in the eight dharmas, or if there is doubt about these eight realities, the ordinary person is bound to commit and accumulate unwholesome karma. Have you unshakable faith in the Buddha? Have you unshakable faith in the Dharma? Have you unshakable faith in the Noble Sangha? Have you unshakable faith in the three trainings? Have you unshakable faith in the law of karma? Have you unshakable faith in past lives? Sometimes you may feel doubt. Is it really that I had past life? Is it really? After this life, I have future life. You may have this doubt. What is the reason? Because you haven't developed unshakable faith. Because you haven't attained first path and fruition knowledge that and Shikava faith is not with you. Any time you can go astray. You may choose something opposite now you are holding. If something danger happened to you. So to be skeptical about the above mentioned eight Dharma is the same as being imprisoned. If you had doubt whether the Buddha is fully enlightened one, you have no freedom. You have no freedom of mind. You are imprisoned. Why? You cannot solve this problem completely. That's why you have no freedom. You are not liberated yet. That's why those who have removed all these doubt, they are liberated. They become a new person. If you have removed these doubt, and if you all, in other words, if you have developed unshakable faith, you become a newly born person. Your mindset changes. Your mindset changes. You are liberated from these skeptical about 
all these eight dharma. That is to say, the person with doubt is not yet liberated. That's why the virtuous stream and Tara, who has removed all doubt and has the utmost unshakable faith, is a truly liberated individual. Do you want to be? I'm giving this talk because I want you all to be liberated from. If you haven't removed such doubt, you are not liberated. Even you live in the democratic country. Even you have freedom, you are not liberated. You are kept yourself into prison. Prison of doubt. If you haven't removed doubt at the near death moment, if such doubt appear, is it true I have new existences? Is it true good give good results, bad give bad results? You die with confused mind. With such death, Buddha said, we cannot be reborn in a good reign. That's why, first of all, if you want to be really liberated individual, you must remove doubts about these eight dharma. Only then, you are liberated to a certain degree. Those who have removed such doubt will never more commit any akusala, which will lead him to the four woeful realms. That's why they are liberated from falling into the four woeful realms too. Please be aware of what the Buddha said. All the ordinary people are foolish. <laughs> Do you angry with me? Are you angry with me? No. Putot jano omatako. All the ordinary people are foolish. Why? They are foolish because of ignorance and craving. Being obsessed with money, possessions and physical comforts, most ordinary people dare to commit killing, stealing, adultery, lying and other wrong actions. In Korea, one gentleman came and see me. One day, every day, we do demonstration for poor people, for those who are in difficulty. So I, I told him, okay, if we compare, you have freedom. If we compare with people of your country and people of our country, your people have more freedom. So you have freedom to demonstrate. When you do, with the intention to help for those who are in Dukkha, for those who are suffering, with the good intention, please don't be angry. I told him, Bande, impossible. 
We are very angry at that time. So we should do for the good of others with the right attitude. They have freedom to demonstrate. They have de freedom to, pro to do protest at that time. If they do with the good mindset, it will be good for them. Another thing, one thing one day he, uh, he told me, it is difficult for me. We develop unity. That's why whatever we do, we do together. Because we need unity to do demonstration. That's why we drink sometime together <laughs> for unity, he told me. So, for money, people do and hold some deeds. Sometimes, for possession, they accumulate and hold some deeds. Now, as he told me, for unity, he, take, he took intoxicants. That's why because of money, because of living, because of possessions, because of position, people commit killing, stealing, adultery, lying, and other wrong actions. People are foolish because of their ego. They say unity, actually just ego. That's why People are foolish because of their ego and because of their self-identity. Ego makes people think that they are better and more important than others. Don't you think you are better and more important than others? Sometime, sometime for sure. People have been blinding themselves so much in their long and wearisome ego trip along the round rebuts that there is no akusala they dare not do in life. Because of ego, endless ego trip, because of serving for your ego, there is nothing what you dare not do in your life if necessary. This is the danger of the, all the ordinary people. So according to the Buddha, the five unwholesome weighty actions, heavy karma, in other words, the commit patricide, matricide, the murder of an arahant, to draw the blood of the Buddha and to create a schism in the Sangha are not beyond the bounds of possibility of ordinary people. Do you remember Ajanta Sattu? Do you know who is Ajanta Sattu? Do you know Ajada Sadhu? Son of Bimbi Sara, who killed his father. For what? To be a king. He was still very young. It is his ego trip. Because of endless ego trip that we make in the rounds of some in the rounds of samsara, we have done many and wholesome deeds. Now you see, Bimbisara, who was a sort of panda, stream enterer, who have developed 
and shake our faith on the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha, three trainings, past lives, present lives, karma and its result. Not the ordinary person, but noble person has been caged with the arrangement of the Prince Ajata Sattu, who is a beloved son of the King Bhimbi Chara. That's why Buddha said, there is nothing what ordinary people dare not do, if necessary. So the cause of wrongdoing is having, ro having no right knowledges. The cause of wrongdoing is, another cause of wrongdoing is associated with the fool. Actually, the Prince Ajata Sattu has fulfilled Barami to be a noble person. After he had killed his father, he could not sleep the whole night because he knew that it is a very big mistake that he had done. Because his son also, his son was born before, after his father died. On that day, he inquired to those who, who he needed to inquire because he loved his son very much. Only at that time, right understanding come into his mind and he inquired, did my father love me? Do you know about, maybe all our Myanmar people know very well. <laughs> Singaporean, do you know much about Ajada Sadhu? So when he was born, when he was very young, so there is a very painful wound happened in his tip of the finger. So it, is very pain, it was very painful that he cried. He cried continuously. So with compassion towards his son, King Bhimbisara, to make it and to make it, to make, to make him feel release. And then he put his son finger into the mouth. And then it broke in inside the mouth. So the blood and pus was in his mouth. But being afraid, his son will be awake. That's why he didn't do anything. He just swallowed the pus and the blood together. So when the Prince Ajada Sattu was told about it, at that time he felt very sorry. He felt guilty for what he has done. He, fe he felt regret for what he had done. Because of associating with Devadatta. That's why in our life, if we associate with an wise person, stupid person, foolish person, long time, we may imitate him or her. We may be influenced by their idea their suggestion at that time we may do wrong. So when he encountered much difficulty because of his regret and his remorse, one day the doctor Jivaka suggested him to see the Buddha. On that day he went to see the Buddha and he asked the benefit of Ordain life, Samyanya Pala Sutta, the benefit of ordained life. So Buddha explained the benefit of 
ordained life, very detailed, very long sutta. It appears in the Diga Nikaya. If you want to read, you can read. There is a translation of Bhikkhu Bodhi. Fortunately, one of my disciples offered me today. Together with the commentary explanation in that book, you should read. You can see the omniscient knowledge of the Buddha in that sutta. But there may be some part you may feel boring because Buddha explained very detailed. But you should read it to understand how great the knowledge of the Buddha. There you can see all the wrong views that appear in time of the Buddha, before the Buddha appear, after the Buddha appear too. What the Buddha said, if Ajata Sattu, who killed the parent, who had committed patricide, if he hadn't done it, up at the end of this discourse, he will attain stream and terror. But he lost that great opportunity because of doing patricide, because of committing patricide, because of associating with the fool. Are you the fool or the wise? This is a question you should ask yourself. What is your answer? Maybe you are quite wise, I think. <laughs> from the worldly point of view, you may think you are wise. But from the Dharma point of view, uh, before, before I will explain a little bit. Those who don't penetrate for noble, noble truths yet, they are called the fool. Okay? Only those who have penetrated the four noble truths are called the wise. Digo balana samsaro, the Buddha said. For the fool, the samsara, the rounds of rebirth, will be long. Do you know the beginning? You know your first point of existence is do you know your beginning point of existence is yes even the Buddha say the beginning point of the samsara is unknown and knowable so it is impossible to know the beginning point that's why Buddha said the beginning point is unknown and knowable. Don't you want to ask me a question because of hearing this? Buddha is omniscient one. Why did he say the beginning point is unknown and unknowable? Why did he say? Have you have you no such question in your mind? No. Oh, you believe in the Buddha very much. <laughs> Unshakable faith is with you, I think. So, maybe 10 years ago, one yogi at Pa'ak Meditation Center, main center, he converted from other religion to Buddhism, very new to Buddhism. He was studying. So he, he rose me a question one day. As you all know, as we all know, Buddha is omniscient one. Who knows all? No one of all. Why did he say the beginning point is unknown and knowable? If it is an omniscient Buddha, he must know the beginning point. Why didn't he know? 
at that time. I could not give the answer why I was very newly ordained person. <laughs> so later, after seven years or six years later, I think, I got the opportunity to read the commentary explanations. There it was explained. When we draw a circle, very neat circle, can you see a beginning point? No, no. Buddha is omniscient one. He knows everything. There is nothing that he doesn't know. He knows that there is no beginning point. That's why the beginning point is unknown and knowable. That's why Buddha said the beginning point is unknown and knowable. Not because he doesn't know, just because he, knew, he knows that there is no beginning point. How can we say when craving starts? True? How can we say where the ignorance starts? The causes of the existence is the ignorance and craving. This craving is like a saga, endlessly overwhelming us. Because of this reason, we are wandering in the rounds of samsara endlessly, one after another. So if we haven't developed unshakable faith, when we are wandering in the rounds of samsara, as the Buddha was, we are those who dare to do such things. Heavy, karma, patricide, matricide, the mother of an arahant, to draw the blood of the Buddha and to create a schism in the Sangha. So all the ordinary, ordinary people are not beyond the bounds of possibility of these and all some actions. That's why you should consider about it. Don't be happy. You have danger. All the ordinary people have a lot of danger. In any condition, if you can't bring under control your defilements, you may commit any unwholesome deeds. That's why, if we take a look at those who are being pulled down into the four four states, it can clearly be seen that they are not yet free of self-identity or doubt. The stream antara, sort of pana, has anger. He or she has greed. He or she has pride. He or she has delusion. Now you completely remove all the awaita, delusion, partially removed, which cover the four noble truths has been removed with the first part then, fruition knowledge. They have anger. They feel angry sometimes. They have pride. They feel proud of themselves sometimes. But their pride, their, the strength of their pride, the strength of the, their anger cannot make them fall into the four four states. What is the reason? The reason is because of having no self-identity. How danger the self-identity view is? Do you understand? I will explain a little bit more. You think I need, I need this beautiful club because of your self-identity. You know, you need, you think, you think that I want to eat very delicious food. 
And you go somewhere where you can get it with set identity view. You react someone, you respond someone because you think they hurt you, they complain you, they accuse you. With the wrong view, set identity view, you respond, you react sometimes very seriously. When someone looks down you because you think high of yourself, everybody, they think high of themselves. This is normal. So because of their pride, if someone looks down at that time, if he, if he uneasy, if he proud of themselves, Sometimes because of pride, they react something very seriously. Because of the influence of self-identity view, they do or they did or they are going to do in the future. I will give more clear example. You have self-identity view. When your son are suffering, what do you feel? Have you son? No. Okay, if it is so, I will ask another question. <laughs> when? I will, I will not ask you. <laughs> Have you son and daughter? Yeah, when your son, eh, daughters, two daughters, when your daughters are suffering, what happened to you? You suffer too, right? In the same way, when you are in bad health, your beloved ones will worry much about you. They feel very unhappy. They feel very sad. Suppose someone very far distance, who you don't know, who is not your beloved ones, you heard from someone, they are suffering. What did you feel? Nothing. Huh? Not, not very. Just so so. Oh. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Only this. Right? Because you didn't hold them with your self-identity view. Because you hold your sons and daughters with your self-identity view. You think, this is my son. This is my daughter. If I say according to Buddha's teaching, it is not your son. It is your, not your daughter. What will you say to me? how crazy this venerable is. Okay, you may say, for example, why this is what you have given birth then. Yeah, conventionally, it is your son. The knowledge, conventional knowledge is not enough for our freedom, for our liberation. So this is because of self-identity you suffer. You heard about someone who is suffering in America, you don't know. You don't feel like what you felt the time your daughter sick. The reason is because you don't hold them with your self-identity view. Those who have removed self-identity view are those who don't feel if someone offer very much because they understand that this is not mine. So how they were feel released much because of having no self identity view. How happy it will be for them that they have removed self identity. How good if you can remove self identity in your life. Even so your sons and daughters are being sick. You will treat them because you love them. 
or you understand that oh, this is all according to their karma, it will not make you much suffer. Which is better? Because of seeing beloved one suffering, we don't suffer, we don't suffer much and we suffer much. Which one do you want to be? But conventionally, your loved one wants to see your worry very much. Okay? If you don't worry, you understand. That's why from the conventional point of view, what people are showing worry, happiness, sadness to one another is welcomed by each other very much. But which is a cause of dukkha? Which is a cause of suffering in the four four states? But from the Dharma point of view, if we don't show and happiness, sadness, worry, much more better. It will not be for the suffering in the bad realms. Which is better? The one who can apply his life, his daily life, with the Dharma. It is better. That's why now among these, only some are old people. Many are young, many are middle age. So when we spend our lifetime in this very life, we all need to develop one thing. It is equanimity towards you yourself and others too. It is very important. Especially when we are getting older. If we have no such mindset, it is very difficult to deal with our old age. When we were young, we may get involved with many things. We like and we dislike. But when we are getting older, we need, more, we need peace of mind. We need calm state of mind more. At that time, we should develop equanimity towards our beloved ones, including oneself. If you don't do so, if you don't develop such quality, what will happen? You, your mind will incline to involve with many other things which can be the cause of suffering in the, in the present and for the future. Also, you will not be a real adult at the time. That's why we all need to develop since we were young. Not to get involved with what really not necessary. What really not necessary. Only to do something what is really necessary in life. This is a very important training. Don't think it is minor. This is very important. If you want to live peacefully at the present, even you are young, you need to develop equanimity towards your seven others. You need to develop equanimity towards both good and bad. When you experience good at that time, if you are very happy, when you encounter difficulty, you will feel very sad. This is normal. That's why if you develop equanimity towards even though you, you experience good, when you encounter difficulty, it will not make you change a lot. That's why this mindset is important. There is no one who wants to go to the four woe four states. Is it true? There is no one who wants to fall to the four or four states. There is nobody who ever prays to go to hell. Right? There is nobody. Although you may not have made a wish to visit the whole woeful, the four or four realms, if you are not free of self identity view, your greed, your hatred, your delusion, 
your jealousy, your pride, and your stinginess that lie hidden in you will cause you to do an awesome karma that will lead to the four or four states. Those who haven't removed the self-identity view, all their actions are, all their actions can be the cause of suffering in the four or four states. Because of this wrong view, they hold their hatred. They hold hatred as their hate, their hatred. They hold greed as their greed. They react or they respond or they make their living according to the instructions of these defilements associated and overwhelmed by the self-identity view. This is the danger that you all have. This is the danger that those who haven't removed self-identity have. In other words, because of self-identity view, you will have unknowingly or knowingly accumulated and wholesome karma that will lead you to the whole four, four woeful states. In that case, you are stay in a shackled existence like any other ordinary person who is merely existing between birth and death and is not liberated yet. Are you the one who are stay in a shackled existence like any other ordinary person? What is your answer? Yes. So, it will be necessary for you to follow that practice which can eradicate self-identity and doubt. If after performing the noble acts of giving, you make the wish to realize Nibbana, do you make it? After performing the noble acts of giving, you make the wish to realize Nibbana. If you do so, it will be the same as having made the wish to be truly liberated. Maybe there may be some, those who make aspiration to be reborn in a good realm or to be reborn as a rich person after making an act of offering. If they make an aspiration in this way after making offering or generosity, it will be the cause to be reborn in a good realm, but it will not be the cause to be liberation. But if you make an aspiration because of these wholesome deeds, such as offering or such as practicing morality, may I be able to realize Nibbana. If you can't make an end of suffering, if you have to make future journey one after another, you will be reborn in a good realm because of that good karma. You may be a rich person too, but when time ripens, that karma will be the cause of liberation. That's why before you can, you become a liberated one, when you are making your future journey, you can be a rich person too, you can be reborn in a good realm too, but it can be the cause of liberation. That's why because of making an aspiration to be able to realize Nibbana, if you can get both results, it is better. That's why, starting from today on, those who make an aspiration to be reborn in a good realm or to be a rich person, stop. <laughs> Just make an aspiration to be the one who can be liberated from rounds of rebirth. The conventionally recognized independence or 
liberation that we celebrate on National Independence Day is not genuine liberation. People are very happy on the National Independence Day, but it is just superficial. It is not genuine liberation. Those noble and virtuous persons who have managed to eradicate self-identity and doubt can begin to witness true liberation as if looking at a ruby which has been placed by your own self on your own palm. Do you get, do you understand it? So those who have realized Nibbana are like a person who put a ruby on his palm. Don't you see clearly with your eyes the ruby on your arms? You see it in the same way. Someone who has eradicated self-identity means someone who can realize Nibbana whenever they want. Path knowledge arises only one time. Fruition knowledge follows. So path knowledge cannot be experienced. What I mean, the first path knowledge cannot be experienced second time. But any time the stream enterer wants to experience fruition knowledge, he can enter fruition again, realizing Nibbana as if he see ruby on his arms, on his palm arms. Why did I tell all of you this? Nowadays, many meditators who reported that they have attained, they have realized Nibbana. I have met with them. Without asking anything, they just told me, I am from this meditation center. My teacher told me, I have attained Sotapanna. And then I ask, Do you see Nibbana? Do you realize Nibbana? Can you enter fruition knowledge anytime you want? And then they answer me. When I realize, when I enter fruition knowledge, I know nothing. Only after coming out from it, I know that I have entered fruition knowledge. Do you understand? The Buddha said, those who attain, those who attain first path and fruition knowledge, they can experience fruition knowledge anytime they want. As if they see ruby on their palm clearly. That's why it is not true that Someone who experiences fruition know nothing. It is very important for all of you. If you want to know the words of the Buddha, you can read in the Angodra Nikaya in the chapter of the tongue, chapter of ten, experiencing Nibbana. Maybe the name will, will not be exact, but it is like experiencing Nibbana. It is not true that those who realize Nibbana know nothing. It is not true. So if you have realized Nibbana, if you don't know nothing, it is not the Nibbana taught by the Buddha. For sure. It is very important. And I ask again, Buddha said any time they want to enter fruition, they can enter. I ask them again. I don't look down. I just clarify them. Can you enter fruition knowledge any time you want? No, very difficult. <laughs> okay. 
Do you know ultimate mentality and materiality? No, I don't. Do you know the cause of ultimate mentality and materiality, which is the second noble truth? No, I don't. Buddha said, without having breakthrough the four noble truths, if someone says, I will make an end of suffering, it is impossible. What is the four noble truths? You all know. What is the first noble truth? Ultimate mentality, ultimate materiality are called the first noble truth. In other words, five aggregates are called the first noble truth, the noble truth of suffering. What is the second noble truth? The cause of suffering. For these existences, if we talk about these existences, ultimate mentality and materiality, they arose. When did they arise? In our mother womb. This is the beginning stage of the arising of suffering. Ultimate, mentality, and materiality. Do you get what I mean? This is the beginning point of the arising of the first noble truth. If it is so, in other words, we can say it is the result of karma. It is the result of past karma. If it is so, the cause of suffering, where will it be? The suffering started in our mother womb. If it is so, where would be the cause of suffering? The second noble truth. It will be in the past. It appeared, it occurred at the near death moment in our previous life. The cause to know the cause of suffering, the second noble truth, we need to descend to the past. Only then you will know the second noble truth. What is the object of insight meditation? Many questions. What is the object of insight meditation? I believe you all want to realize the Dharma. I believe you all want to be liberated. I believe you all want liberation. But if you want to be liberated, one, you need to practice inside meditation, what we call vipassana. So what is the object of vipassana? First noble truth and second noble truth are, are the object of inside meditation. If it is so, if you don't know the first noble truth, if you don't know the second noble truth, we have no objects to contemplate impermanent suffering and non-self. Ultimate mentality and materiality, they are arising and perishing very, very rapidly. Only when you see, only when you know, ultimate mentality and materiality, you will understand it. In this audience, there is some, those who have penetrated. For them, it is very clearly 
the understand. Buddha said this whole world is made up of small particles. Very, very tiny small particles. If I ask you, now some, they have ballpoint pen. Very small ballpoint pen. If you look at the tip of the ballpoint, is it clear for you? Not very clear. Okay? Because it is very small. You need to adjust if you become old. <laughs> for me too. <laughs> So now I cannot, I need to adjust. <laughs> it, it is telling me that I am getting old. So for those who have realized, who have penetrated ultimate materiality, they can see many small tiny particles at the tip of the ballpoint pen. Much, much smaller than that ballpoint pen. Think how small it is. Very, very small. Rapidly arising and perishing. The day you realize it, when you look at your body with your concentration, you don't see your body. You just see those small particles which are arising and perishing rapidly all the time. If you pay attention to those who are sitting nearby, you see them in the same way. Everything's become the same. This table, this mic, this recorder, this cup, everything's living and non-living things become the same. Buddha said, whether living things or non-living things, they all are made up of small particles, nothing else. Only at that time you will agree with the Buddha. You will agree that what the Buddha had taught is really true. At that time, you will agree that there is no man, there is no woman, there is no your daughters, there is no your wife and husband. There is only ultimate materiality which are arising and perishing rapidly all the time. Don't you want to see? If you want to liberate, if you want to liberate, you must see them. This is very important thing that you need to see in your life. After that you need to continue to see, to know ultimate mentality. So if you know these two, you know the first noble truth. Only those who see ultimate mentality and materiality, they can descend to their past. They can descend the causes of these ultimate mentality and materiality. Actually, the second noble truth, which is a cause of suffering also, from the ultimate point of view, they are just ultimate mentality and Materiality too. Also arising and perishing rapidly all the time. If you look at the past, just you see, you just see arising and perishing. If you pay attention yourself, you see arising and perishing. If you looked for what? To your future. In the future, if you are going to be reborn as a human, also just arising and perishing. If you pay attention to the external beings, you just see the arising and perishing all the time. So Buddha said, there is nothing. There is only ultimate mentality and materiality which are arising and perishing rapidly all the time. Only at that time, you can contemplate them as impermanence, suffering and unself. Seeing them arising and perishing rapidly. By doing so, one day, your insight will mature. At that time, or before it, 
You need to change your attention towards the perishing only, not on the arising. It is called Bhanga Jnana. Just emphasizing on the perishing. By doing so, your inside knowledge will mature. At the time, you may feel fear of these dharma because they are arising and perishing all the time. You fear very much, you frighten. At a certain time, this, this desire, this wish may occur in you. You want to be free from all these things which are arising and perishing. You want to liberate from it. And then if you continue, you will attain the knowledge of equanimity towards the formations. It is in Pali, Sankaru Pekka Jnana. At that time, you have no fear. But your inside knowledge is very sharp. You see very clearly the perishing, but you have no fear. You have equanimity towards these all arising and perishing. That knowledge is very near to the path knowledge. If you continue your practice, at that time, path knowledge will arise. Removing self-identity view, doubt, attachment to right and rituals. You became, you become sort of panna, stream, and terror, realizing nibbana. That's why I told all of you, those noble and virtuous persons who have managed to eradicate self-identity and doubt can begin to witness true liberation as if looking at the ruby which has been placed by your own self on your own palm. To describe further, those who have attained to sort upon a stream entera have been liberated and have at, at most, sorry, at most only seven more existence to endure. Not more than seven existences. They will progress gradually, step by step, until they finally attain Arahant path and fruition knowledge, and hence total liberation. To attain this, one must take the opportunity to learn the practice of morality, the practice of concentration, and the practice of wisdom. From those learned teachers who are at present, available to us. If we don't take the opportunity to approach these teachers when it is available, we can never be sure of being liberated from this seemingly endless round of rebirths. In fact, we are in danger of drifting farther and farther away as we migrate from one rebirth to another. Therefore, what we need to do is to diligently attain the true liberation from the Dharma point of view rather than from the accepted worldly viewpoint and to be included in that minority of individuals who have attained true liberation. Do you want to be included in the majority or do you want to be included in the minority of individuals who have attained true liberation? Now where are you in? You are in the majority, you are not in the minority. Very dangerous, you know? In order to attain true liberation, we should emulate those noble, virtuous and enlightened Buddhas and other individuals of 
ancient times, who strove hard and who attained genuine liberation through going forth and practicing the development of morality, concentration, and wisdom. All those present at this Dharma talk have so far been performing the noble acts of giving dana and noble acts of doing morality, sila, right? Now, I wish that all of you will be able to diligently, steadfastly strive to practice those noble practices, morality, concentration, and wisdom mentioned earlier in order to grasp, grasp and attain that genuine liberation, that is, the deathless state of Nibbana. May you all be able to liberate. May you all be able to make an end of suffering in this very life through engaging diligently the training of morality, the training of concentration, the training of insight in this very life. Arambata nikamata yungzata buddha tadani Dunata mizu no tina nala garan wa kungzaro Buddha tadani pya miyaswa tadana do nai Arambata ato chagunglo Nikamata tamyao jang lo lago piu chagunglo Yongze ta bawa na ni shen do lung la gu a tu cha gu no. Gongze ro sin piang ji di. Na la ga ran ju in gu du na ti i wa pya si bi ta ke do. Mi zu na tung ze ta na yin gan pa yin san so ne shen te mi te na si ti go. Do not tap your seat, Jago law. It is no tear or do booty, maintain your tea. Was a gruna she tam your tap ye. Hot out of mooke, baby the dee.